Hello and welcome to News Click. We're going to discuss a controversial figure and an iconic figure today, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Um, we have with us um, Dr. Talat Ahmed. She is the co-director of the Center for South Asian Studies at the University of Edinburgh, and she's recently written a book called Mohandas Gandhi: Experiments in Civil Disobedience. So, uh, welcome to News Click. Um, Thank you. You know, I want to begin with what triggered you to write this book and you have re-examined Gandhi's life and his political life. Uh, what were the basic reasons why you set out to do this? Oh, no, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. Um, yes, I suppose Gandhi, as you say, is an incredibly iconic figure. And um, one of the things that I've been struck as a historian is how new generations of young people in particular are still looking to Gandhi. Um, in Britain, you know, where, where I live, it's very pronounced, um, particularly amongst um, young students and other young people. Um, I think particularly when they're looking to how social change can come about in society. So, for example, in Britain, we have a mass movement evolving against climate change. This has been the largest movement that we have seen in British society for almost 30 years. And the activists that are engaged in this are using the tactics of nonviolent civil disobedience. This is a movement that began in October 2018, and they've had three major bouts of civil disobedience. When they first began, they brought London to a standstill because what they did is they had mass protests on various bridges, the main arteries, into London, and they just sat down. Uh, and refused to move until the police moved them. They just brought London to a, st a standstill at that time. We've also had, as a result of this, um, school kids that have been involved. We've had school children walk out of schools on two Fridays in the last 12 months um, in enormous protest against lack of effective uh, controls on climate change activity. So the issue of the climate, the issue of the planet has really galvanized young people throughout Britain as it has done in Europe, in America. And in Britain, the movement is called Ex Extinction Rebellion. Right. Um, and I know that there's also an Indian chapter of this. Um, and it's a worldwide movement. And what's really phenomenal is that when these people have been asked why they are engaged in this kind of activity, they've invoked Mohandas Gandhi's name. Um, we have people who, as I say, they will just, uh, there will be thousands of them that will just sit down in protest. So we have people that just sat down in protest outside the Ministry of Defence. We've had people who have used glue and they've glued themselves to pavements, uh, to walls, in protests against um, the armaments industry, in protests against various government agencies um, that they are targeting because they are refusing to do anything serious about carbon emissions. Um, and these people have also been willing to get themselves arrested. And again, when they have been arrested, they don't show any opposition. Um, they don't resist arrest in any shape or form. And again, when they have been interviewed and asked why, they have all cited Gandhi's nonviolent civil disobedience as the catalyst for this, as the inspiration for this. Is it working? Will this help save the environment? That's a really big question. Um, and I suppose in a way the short answer would be that, you know, and we won't know until the business is done. But on the other hand, um, what I think is quite fascinating for me as a historian is that when we look at civil disobedience and particularly the use of nonviolence, this isn't the first and only time that this has happened since Gandhi's death. In Britain, we've had um, civil disobedience that was used back in the early 1980s. Uh, for example, against the cruise missiles that were coming into Britain. We had a movement then which was called the, women, uh, the Greenham Common Women's Movement, where they built a camp outside of Greenham Common, which was going to be the base of where these cruise missiles were going to come. Um, and they had a camp out there. They exercised nonviolent civil disobedience. It didn't stop the cruise missiles from being brought into Britain. So in that sense, one could argue that the movement against it was ineffective. Um, so I think it's, you know, people cite obviously things like the civil rights movement in the United States. People even talk about African emancipation as being another inspiring point in terms of Gandhi's nonviolence. For me as a historian, it was really imperative to interrogate at a very serious level how Gandhi actually embarked upon 
civil disobedience in order to try and examine what worked and what didn't work in there. Because Gandhi obviously is, an, is a larger than life figure. He was in his lifetime and even more so since his death in some respects. He's become even more iconic, more, more symbolic. So Mahatma. Absolutely. You know, the, the Mahatmaism has really been in the making in the last 70 years, more so than it was in his own lifetime. And um, of course, sadly, a lot of misconceptions can exist about an individual. A lot of half-truths um, can also enter the narrative. Um, and because he is such a huge figure, I think it's really important that people actually do make a study of him. So, for example, again, in Britain, we have um, people in Extinction Rebellion who put on training sessions in nonviolent direct action. And that's all very laudable. It's fantastic. It's very good that they do this. Um, and it's very good that they have tens of thousands of people that are involved and engaged in wanting to learn the art of nonviolence and how to practice it in, as a political strategy. Uh, but I also think it's really important that people and activists should learn from history. Um, so I think it's imperative that people should attempt to at least read what Gandhi had written himself about his own movements. It's also important that people should read other biographies that have been written about Gandhi and other studies that have been done about him, not just my book. And so I'm hoping that if my book is able to do anything, if it is at least able to propel a new generation of activists, particularly in Britain, but also hopefully here in India, to actually go and seek for themselves who the real Gandhi was, uh, what it was that he did, what it was that he didn't do, what he sanctioned, what he was okay with, etc then it will have served a purpose. At the time when Gandhi ran his civil disobedience uh, in India, mm -hmm. um, we were under a foreign occupation. And many of these civil disobedience movements now are against their own government. Uh, so, so how is that moment different from now? Is, is civil disobedience, is non-violent protest actually viable in these circumstances? of being under control of your own government. Mm -hmm. is, is it in fact more effective now um, because, because you have uh, less of a sanction for the state to oppress its own people, whereas the colonial power could have done anything to uh, whichever country it governed? Mm. Now again, that's a really good question because I think that um, at one level, yes, one can look back in history and say, well, of course, when there was colonial oppression, then somehow there was legitimacy to have opposition against that. Um, but now that we've had independence for over 70 years, um, that somehow we now live in a new society. Right. But I think that that also is something that fundamentally ignores some of the challenges of what post-colonial societies had. Um, and I think that if we think about, for example, whether it's in India or whether it's in different countries in Africa, it's clear that the dream of what independence was supposed to bring for most people has perhaps not transpired at all. Um, so I don't find it at all surprising that in country after country, um, in the so-called global south, there have been oppositional movements against their own states because we still have societies which are racked by division. Poverty still exists. Oppression still exists against various groups. I mean, even in Britain, you know, people think of Britain as being a nice liberal democracy. There have always been oppositional movements from below against British governments. So I don't think that the key difference is whether or not it's a colonial state or not, or a post-colonial state. The key question is what kind of society it is and what are the grievances that people feel about the world that they live in. Um, and I think it's only when one examines what the grievances are and what the vast inequalities are within society, only by doing that can we then co come close to approximating why it is that we will have movements of opposition. Right. They don't right. exist just for the sake of existing, they exist because there's a very stark reality in those societies. And so the non-violent talk about nonviolence actually imposes on the people a very great burden of not doing certain things, not acting in certain ways. Mm. Um, and the, the, but the issue is that if you do act in certain ways which are violent or seen as violent, then the state would have even more power to crack down on you. Mm. So this is something that the activists would have to constantly consider. Mm. Um, and, and, and Gandhi provides a, um, a way out of that challenge. He does in many respects, yes. I suppose that you know, for, for Gandhi, 
the use of violence is seen as being completely non-permissible in his eyes, yeah. uh, whether it's by the state or whether it's by movements. Um, and in his own lifetime, these were very real questions that he had to grapple with because although his movements and particularly every one of the major movements that he launched, he launched them in the name of nonviolence. However, violence did occur. So in my book, I go through a whole series of scenarios of his major campaigns, whether it's in South Africa or back at home in India. And in each one of these scenarios, he leads the campaign in opposition. In each one of these scenarios, violence is employed mm -hmm. and it has been employed by the state. And in each one of these scenarios, Gandhi then calls off the movement because what happens is that violence also takes place on the part of the resistors. Mm -hmm. um, and Gandhi calls the movement off because violence has been employed by his own side. And for me, this is where the tension and this is where the interrogation and this is where the debate really needs to be about. Because in his own lifetime, he faced criticism from people for calling off these movements. Um, you know, Gandhi was a great <coughs> communicator. He spoke with everyone and anyone. Um, it didn't matter whether you agreed or disagreed with him. He would have debate and discussion with you. He had debates and discussions with people within his own camp around Congress. He had debates with people from the right, but also in his lifetime, he faced big debates from people who were on the left. So, for example, he had enormous um, debates and discussions with uh, the left in terms of the Congress Socialists and the Communist Party of India. In my own book, one of the things I detail is the correspondence that Gandhi had with uh, P.C. Joshi, for example, in um, 1945. At that time, he was the General Secretary of the Communist Party of India. And two decades before that, in 1927, Gandhi entered a lengthy correspondence with Saklatvala, um, who was the uh, first communist MP to be elected in Britain. Um, eventually became a member of the Labour Party. Um, and um, in both of these discussions, it was about the question of nonviolence. That was at the heart of this, because what both Saklatvala and Joshi were talking about is, what do you do when the state is violent towards you? And this was a question that wasn't just asked by those two, it was asked by many activists within Gandhi's own lifetime. Um, it was asked by people following the big bout of civil disobedience in 1930, when that movement was perhaps the most nonviolent that Gandhi had ever led on his own side, and yet the colonial state put over 60,000 people into jails. Um, and then by 1934, they if very effectively physically crushed any aspect of civil disobedience um, over tax and other issues. Um, similarly, when we think about the Quit India movement in 1942, you know, not only was Gandhi detained and, you know, leading members of the Congress were detained, um, but the government, the viceroy at the time, Lynn Lithgow, he gave the go-ahead for aerial bombardments of cities like Bombay, as they were then. And Lynn Lithgow himself said that what we are facing in 1942 is the biggest threat to British power in India since the 1857 mutiny. And I'm not going to get caught out that way, was his attitude. And that's why he unleashed the level of repression that he did. Um, again, one of the things that I go through in my book is um, the early 20s when Gandhi has his um, non-cooperation movement. And there, it is very striking to me because Gandhi calls off movements all the time when violence is used on his side. Um, but he's quite particular as to who he blames for violence. Yeah. Um, so for example, in the small town of um, Ch Chaurichura in 1922, when you have, because because one of the key things about Gandhi's movements is that although they're called under a very specific rubric, the masses of Indians at the time, they brought to that movement their own set of grievances. So you had grievances against landlords, you had grievances against stall holders, shopkeepers, you had grievances um, against um, employers. Um, and Gandhi, you know, at one level, perhaps Gandhi was impervious to the fact that the masses were bringing their own set of grievances to his movements. Um, and at, it really comes to fruition 
in that town because you have protests taking place in that town against inflation and hikes in food prices because people just can't afford to buy bread. They can't afford to buy the arta to make their chapati. And so there are enormous protests taking place um, and the police arrest three of the protesters. Um, and as a result, you have people from the local locality going to the police station to demand the release of their uh, of their of their of their townspeople. Um, the police, for various reasons, are told that they've got to defend this, um, and they let off some rounds and they arrest more people. But they also shoot some people who are killed. Obviously, in a scenario like that, tempers are very very hot on both sides. Um, and because Indians had been killed, you have the villagers and the townspeople, they come to the police station and they are rioting. And in the violence that ensues, the police station is set on fire, 22 policemen die. Now, obviously, nobody is happy with that situation. The villagers weren't happy with that situation. Nobody was. Now, Gandhi calls off on violence immediately as that incident happens. But what is very striking to me when you look at his pronouncements, at what he writes in newspapers at the time, and you also look at the pronouncements of Congress who are acting under his guidance and his leadership, they send condolences to the widows and the families of the policemen. Nothing wrong with that. But there are no condolences that are sent to the Indians who've been killed. There are no words of solace for their families and their widows. Instead, they are described as being a mob by Gandhi and by the Congress leaders. And this happens again and again. This is repeated. I mean, this is, you know, this is <clears throat> one of the things that I, I found when I was doing the research for my book, is that there is a consistent pattern to this. And so one of the questions I pose is that it's all very well talking about civil disobedience being nonviolent. But actually, we have to get quite concrete about this, because what does it mean in a very real situation? So, for example, in Britain, um, with Extinction Rebellion, the police have been used against them, obviously, in terms of arresting people. There's not been the level of violence by the state as it existed in colonial India or as existed by the British state in previous um, protests before. But it may come. And then the question is, what does a movement do? when the state uses violence. Um, this is a question that's being posed very starkly in Hong Kong, for example, mm -hmm. where again, there are many people that are saying, ah, you see in Hong Kong, people are invoking Gandhi there as well, and they are. But there is a real, a real issue there, because what do you do when you have a violent state um, that is go, going to not just use repression, but use that repression to completely cut the movement and to destroy the movement and crush it. Right. So I think that these are very important questions. And if civil disobedience and non-violent civil disobedience is going to be employed as a political strategy, which it usually is, and this is really where my book is trying to interrogate this, then it's very important that people should be very serious about this. You know, I find it amazing that the world over Gandhi's name is known. It's known by little school children. Uh, but people don't really have any real knowledge of Gandhi. And one of the things I say to people, and particularly to young activists in the UK, is that if you really want to honour Gandhi, then at least go and read him. At least go and read what has been written about him. Read everything and anything. Uh, educate yourself about Gandhi in a very serious way. Because otherwise, to just talk and invoke Gandhi in a very loose manner, you're not really doing justice to him and his life. And you're not really doing justice to the kinds of campaigns that you're involved with either. So do some serious reading, debate with people, discuss with people, because Gandhi did that as well. Um, you know, wherever you stand on Gandhi, one, what one cannot deny is that he did enter debate and discussion. Right. So if contemporary generations are serious about invoking Gandhi, then they should make a serious study of him. Right, but he did not leave behind a blueprint for how to be nonviolent. Absolutely, of course he didn't. Um, and again, in that sense, I suppose one could argue that the beauty of that is that anyone can read everything and anything into it. You can employ it in whichever way you wish to. Um, you know, so for example, um, I, you know, I, in, um, in something else that I've written about Gandhi, which is to do with the afterlives of civil disobedience, one of the things that I found quite intriguing is how you have a whole scenario of various politicians all over the world claiming to stand in Gandhi's legacy. 
Um, I found it quite amusing that, for example, Barack Obama talked about how Gandhi had influenced him right. um, from a very young age. And he did this as president of the biggest and mightiest state on the planet, just as he was about to order bombardment of Iraq. So, you know, for me, when you have politicians doing this, you have to ask yourself a serious question, which is, you know, A, how serious are they about Gandhi? How serious are they really about nonviolence? And in a way, is this also not typical of what some politicians do when they want to try and cloak themselves in the mantle of such an iconic figure? and use him perhaps for their own purposes. I mean, you know, we have a similar thing in Britain as well, because obviously, as you can imagine, we have um, various um, public um, places which are named <coughs> after Gandhi. So there's a big statue that was unveiled um, in the House of Parliament. And um, we had David Cameron and George Osborne all saying there's nothing more fitting than to have the father of the Indian democracy outside the mother of all parliaments, with no sense of irony that the mother of all parliaments, the British parliament, did the most to oppress India um, and, you know, a quarter of the world that the British controlled at that time. So I find it quite amusing, ironic, and very, very, very um, dishonest that you have all manner of the political class the world over that want to try and make Gandhi into a very safe, iconic figure for their own purposes. Um, so I think that there is a real issue here about what the real legacy of Gandhi is and, as well. And, and again, you know, if you think of the Pune Pact, if you think of Gandhi and Ambedkar's communication mm. with each other, um, there was a lot of violence that the Dalits faced mm. at the time of demand for a separate electorate. Mm. But at that time, Gandhi did not back down. He did not say, OK, uh, we'll come back to this again. He mm. stuck to his position against the idea of separate electorates. Mm. Would, you know, two questions. Would would that have been a good or a better idea for India, considering the extent of caste discrimination that still uh, prevails in the society? And, and second, uh, I know Gandhi is contradictory. I know he's not a comfortable figure. But does this incident actually show a very big flaw in his idea of nonviolence? Again, that's a really big question, and obviously, I'm you know I'm aware that there are all kinds of contemporary debates in India about this. Um, but what I do know about with certainty is that yes, in his own lifetime, over the issue of caste and untouchability, Gandhi was completely opposed to untouchability. Of that, I have no doubt. You know, he was very sincere about this, and he was very sincere about how he wanted to see an eradication of um, the way that uh, you had caste oppression throughout India. Um, however, his dealings with Ambedkar, from what I have found, um, I don't particularly think were that noble. Um, you know, in the debates over the separate electorates and what he did um, that year in, um, in 1932, um, I think leaves a lot of questions that have to be talked about. Um, the way that he was willing to use the fast and therefore to use violence in some respects to <coughs> his own body, um, you know, fast unto death to stop the separate electorates. And not just that, but the fact that Ambedkar was forced to back down by fellow Dalits because they were aware that if Gandhi had fasted himself to death, the people that would have been given the blame would have been Dalits, and therefore there would have been even more of a bloodbath against Dalits all over India at that time for this. Um, now, I find that very troubling because that to me opens up a big can of worms about what Gandhi and Gandhiism is. Um, you know, the fact that he could not understand that Dalits had a right to have their own political representation and to decide for themselves their own future in his own lifetime, I think really displays, and I argue this in my book, um, a real sense of his own elite caste and class prejudices which were really coming to the fore, that somehow he believed that caste, high caste groups could somehow be persuaded through a moral conscience to behave well towards untouchables. Now, that might well be the case. You know, I'm not in a position to, 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 to state otherwise on that. But the point for me remains that surely it is the right of those people themselves to act as agents and catalysts of their own future and their own present. 
not for someone else to decide what that should be for them. Mm -hmm. And a similar thing, you know, a similar thing I find over his issue on women, over his issue um, on peasants, that there is a paternalism that is at the heart of Gandhi that one cannot deny. Um, and therefore, a figure that is held up as an iconic figure of radical liberation, I think needs to have that level of scrutiny. It, it, you know, there needs to be interrogation about exactly how radical Gandhi and his ideas were in his own lifetime. Because um, you know, I, I do think that the element of deep paternalism does betray a deep social conservatism, particularly about certain social issues. And caste was certainly one of them in his own lifetime. Right. When at that time, everything was on the drawing table. Mm -hmm. You could have written everything afresh. Why not this yes. as well? There were recent protests in South Africa about installing a statue of Gandhi. Where, um, you know, where, do you, where would you locate protests like this uh, coming very long after Gandhi uh, has died and very long after his role in that country has been sort of consecrated as, you know, he was great. And then suddenly you have people saying that, look, he wasn't that great. Uh, mm. Why does this happen? Is, is something like that necessary in, in India? Or do we just need to hear those people who are already saying that they have problems with Gandhi mm. on cars, etc.? You know, uh, what's really going on in South Africa? What can India learn? I think it's quite um, instructive at lots of levels, I suppose, the whole um, movement that Gandhi should fall, as it's called in uh, throughout Africa. Um, you know, beginning in Ghana, where they wanted a statue removed, because oh, what's happened is that um, you've had a new generation of people who suddenly have discovered um, that Gandhi, in his early life in South Africa, had, to put it quite mildly, very pejorative attitudes towards the African population. And there's no getting away from that. He did. Uh, you know, in his initial few years in South Africa, he behaved very much as a colonial subject uh, who believed that Indians had a right to be treated as equals. Actually, I should clarify that. He actually believed that respectable Indians had a right to be treated as equals under empire. Um, and because, because he went to South Africa to represent the professional class, the urban layers of the, you know, the lawyers, the business community, etc. It was very much their interests uh, that affected him. It was their interest that he <coughs> went to represent. Um, and it was through their lens that he saw the world. Um, and in a way, that's not surprising, given his own caste background and everything else. This is what Gandhi's world was. So not only did Gandhi not really have any understanding of the vast majority of Indians who were from uh, predominantly Tamil or Bengal background, who, of course, were the plantation right. uh, workers and working in the mines and what have you. Uh, but of course, it goes uh, without saying that if he, didn't, if he didn't understand them, he obviously was also not going to understand the vast majority of the population of South Africa that were African. And th that's the reason why he initially was absolutely outraged that uh, Indians were placed on the same level as the Africans. Um, and that's why he objected to being called a coolie barrister and all of this kind of language. Because, of course, what he was expressing was that I'm an educated Indian. We should be treated <laughs> as equals under this empire. So that was certainly true, and there's nothing that anyone can do to deny that. However, I think it's completely inaccurate, historically, to leave the story at that, because Gandhi did undergo a change in his life in South Africa. Um, and he did come to understand um, the oppression against Africans, and he also came to understand the oppression against the vast majority of the Indian population. And not just the Indians, but also <coughs> the Chinese population uh, in South Africa and the coloreds. And that's what I think is quite distressing about some of the calls that Gandhi should fall. Because for me, Gandhi is not a Cecil Rhodes. You know, R Rhodes was an unapologetic defender of empire. Yeah. Gandhi was not that. So um, I think that it's good that a new generation have suddenly come across these kinds of questions. But what, should, what this should lead to, surely, is a questioning about the fact that we still live in a racist society. Uh, if you, whether it's South Africa, whether it's Ghana, whether it's any of the European countries, you know, Britain where I come from, and I'm sure there are issues here in India as well, that there, are, there is fundamental inequality that still exists within our society. And it's that that needs to be interrogated and talked about, not demands that Gandhi should be removed, because in a way, you know, statues are not really that important. You know, Vladimir Lenin once said that statues are only good for pigeons. And I think he was quite 
act in that. Um, but the, you know, the point is that in a country like South Africa, you can't have a position where there are no statues to Gandhi or no streets named after him because he was part and parcel of the fabric of that society. And so therefore it's not about changing that and removing his names. What this should be about is an opportunity for a new generation of people to actually be very serious and pose serious questions and not just think that, oh, if we just remove a statue of Gandhi, somehow we've solved the problems of racism in Ghana or South Africa or any other problems, because you haven't. Because what you've not done is actually tackled some of the deeper underlying causes of those problems in the first place. If you're serious about being an agent for yourself, then you're only going to learn this through, through your own colleagues, through your own collectivity, in terms of the activity that you're engaged in and the social movements that you're a part of. It's that activism itself that's going to lead to questions. And the way that you answer those questions and how you resolve those issues is going to be through collective debate and discussion yourselves in the movements. That's what a movement is really about. And yes, there are certain things that we can learn from history and we have to. That's absolutely imperative. But you yourself are going to have to take decisions about this. So read Gandhi by all means. Read about him by all means. But more fundamentally, I would say to people, you need to read, debate, discuss and take action. Read, debate, discuss and take action again and again. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for joining NewsClick. Thank <laughs> you.